just checking the stream is working. So now that we've talked about small molecule medicine, so now that we've talked about small molecule medicines and protein-based medicines, we're going to talk about a type of medicine that you may not have encountered before. We're going to talk about using whole living cells as medicines. And this may sound a little surprising, but there are several advantages to using whole living cells as medicines. First, cells can respond dynamically to changes in their environment, which means they can kind of adapt on the fly to disease progressions or other environmental changes. They also have some remarkable innate abilities. Here in this video, you can see a macrophage, that's a type of human immune cell, chasing after a bacteria. This cell's job is to keep infections in check in your body and so the back uh, the macrophage will chase after bacteria and you can see it making all of these dynamic decisions right it changes direction it knows when to stop when it's gotten that bacteria and that's pretty awesome if we could maybe help the macrophage recognize or chase after bacteria that it doesn't usually do a good job with or make other modifications to it that help it along we can start to consider them potentially as a whole cell medicine. So that's an example of something that could theoretically be a whole cell medicine. There's an additional advantage to having living cells as medicine, and that is that some of them can self-replicate. Your bottle of Tylenol never makes a copy of itself, but a whole cell will. And so these are things that can continue to grow and make more of themselves, and that in certain situations can be advantageous. Here's an example from some students out of the University of Cambridge to engineer E. coli to diagnose disease. They engineered E. coli in order to produce a protein that was so bright it turned the bacteria different colors. What you're seeing at the bottom of this slide are actually tubes full of e different strains of E. coli that have um, been engineered to produce different what's called chromoproteins or colorful proteins. So you can see that the colors are really vivid and the students thought it would be great to administer them sort of like probiotics. You'd get a little capsule full of these bacteria and then you would swallow it and the bacteria would break out of the capsule and then live inside of your gut. And they wouldn't be producing this colorful protein all the time. Students thought it would be a good idea if they only produced the colorful protein in response to biomarkers that were indicative of different diseases. So for example, if the E. coli happened to encounter a salmonella or a worm or a stomach ulcer, then they might start expression of one of these colorful proteins. The expression of that colorful protein would then turn the person's poop a specific color and based on the color of your poop you would know oh i might have a stomach ulcer i should probably go to the doctor and seek treatment i think this is really fun um, one of my favorite parts about this is that these colorful poops were actually um made they're they're plastic but they were made um for an exhibit at the new york museum of modern art and were on display for quite a while. And so it's clearly an idea that has captured a lot of people's imagination and attention. Um, I should say it doesn't actually exist. You can't go to the store and buy a bottle of this colorful E. coli. Um, but that idea is out there and increasingly the tools to make it a reality are becoming available or are available, I should say. One um, of the things I want to point out about this is that it is just a diagnose or a diagnosed uh, diagnostic tool. 
The bacteria don't actually do anything to treat these diseases, but I think it's feasible to imagine having the expression of the blue protein in response to worms in your gut, for example, also initiate expression of some sort of therapeutic protein that helps to get rid of the worms. So that the bacteria were not just telling you that you might have some sort of infection, but that you they would begin to help treat it as well. And so maybe you could go through an entire bout of infection with worms or food poisoning by salmonella and never really know because it's cleared from your system before you start to show symptoms. Now, there is actually a company um, that is working on engineering gut bacteria to treat diseases. This company is called Synlogic. They're based in Boston, Massachusetts, and they are engineering E. coli to treat NASH. NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and it is a um, fatty liver disease, and they are proposing to treat it. <clears throat> excuse me. They're proposing to treat it by overexpressing um, specific compounds in the E. coli once it gets into your gut. And so the idea is that these bacteria would relieve the symptoms associated with NASH, which is pretty exciting. So be on the lookout for products from Synlogic. You might be seeing a bioengineered bacteria available as a medicine to treat this disease. There are some kind of more um, cutting edge, um, well, I'd say the Synlogic stuff is also cutting edge. This is a very recent paper, so recent that it's on an archive server. It's not actually published yet um, out of a lab here at Stanford. And in this study, Stanford researchers used a skin bacteria called Staphylococcus epidermidis to train a mouse's immune system to recognize cancer cells as an infection and treat them the same way that macrophage was treating that bacteria, it was trying to get rid of all of these cancer cells. Now, you might have heard of staph infections. Those are caused by Staphylococcus aureus. That's sort of like a sister to this bacteria. Staphylococcus epidermidis is actually a common colonizer of skin. There is probably some living on you right now. And so this bacteria is safe. It's a normal inhabitant of your skin microbiome. And by engineering it to display a little piece of a tumor, um, or a, a it's called a tumor antigen, so a little piece of protein that's usually found on the surface of a tumor cell, you could get um, the mouse's immune system to be trained to recognize that as infectious and clear it from the body. So when the Stanford researchers, Dr. Aaron Chen and Professor Michael Fishbach, um, swabbed some of this engineered bacteria behind the ear of the mouse, of a mouse, and then gave the mouse a small tumor they found that the tumor grew, did, was not able to grow. So the control or the samples where the engineered bacteria was administered are these OVA samples in blue. These others are controls where there was either no bacteria given, that's the naive control, and um, or an unmodified staph ep epidermidis was given. And that's this control. And in both cases, the tumor continues to grow, but when the bacteria is displaying this antigen, it does not. So it looks like this might be a way of kind of having a vaccine against cancer or a prophylactic treatment so that your immune system knows that it should be on the lookout for these specific proteins because those commonly occur on the surface of tumor cells. Um, and so it's an, another nice example of using a whole cell to do this. And one of the reasons why a whole cell is, um, well, okay, so Aaron and Michael are going to be figuring out how all of this works. We don't know exactly how the tumors that are the T cells, the immune cells that are recognizing this um, staph epidermidis displayed protein are getting access to it because they're on the surface of the skin and most of the T cells are in circulation in 
in your body, um, but they're they're going to try to figure it out. What we know at this point is that the engineered bacterium has this effect, but the individual protein applied to the skin does not. So kind of an interesting use of an engineered bacteria. The whole cell medicines don't have to just be bacteria. You can actually engineer human cells too in order to treat different types of um, cancers. So we'll get into this in much more detail in the cancer section. I just wanted to point out that um, engineered human cells actually have been used to cure cancers. These work well against lymphomas. Um, and the mechanism by which they do it, again, I think we'll cover in the cancer section. So what I'll leave you with in, in terms of this is just a New York Times story that talks about how the cancer treatments are very effective. They make leukemia, they can cure leukemia, but they have um, some patients who get these therapies do have relapse or um, reoccurrence of cancer at a later date. Some have unusual side effects with fevers and things that sort of resemble an infection. And um, these types of CAR T, um, these engineered T cell treatments, they don't work against all types of cancers. They're not good against solid tumors. And so there's still a lot more work to do to figure out how we might be able to tackle you know, different types of cancers, potentially by modifying our own cells to recognize them as a problem and start clearing them from the body. Okay, I want to challenge you um, to think about whether um, it's good or bad that all of the examples that we've talked about have been medicines for people. We're not the only living things on the planet. So what about making medicines for our friends, for our non-human friends? We're going to go through an example later in this course that's um, about this Panamanian golden frog. This is a frog that was last seen in the wild in 2009. It's a really small frog that is very poisonous and is usually found in the Panama cloud forests and um, some central rainforests in South America. And this frog is going extinct because it keeps um, getting infections from a fungal pathogen. And so there is an idea that maybe you could engineer the skin bacteria of this frog to fight off that infection. We'll go through how all of that works later. I just wanted to give this to you as food for thought. Maybe we could make medicines for our non-human friends to do things like help reintroduce them to the wild where there's still a lot of that fungal pathogen, but no frogs. Okay, and the last thing I'll leave you with is some breaking news. This is a paper that literally came out today reporting the de novo design of luciferases using a deep using deep learning. What does that mean? Well, luciferases are the enzymes that are responsible for light emission from things like fireflies or um uh, deep water jellyfish and other uh, bioluminescent organisms. And a, these researchers, in fact, David Baker, so when you do the PSET, or if you've already done watched the video associated with the PSET, you'll be familiar with David Baker. His lab at the University of Washington was able to design an enzyme from scratch that also produces light when given the correct chemical substrate. In order to get this protein a functional new luciferase, they tested about 7,500 designs. And I know that sounds like a lot, but this protein is 117 amino acids long. And if you were to sample the entire space, the entire design space for 117 am amino acid long protein, there would be 10 to the 152 different possibilities. There's basically that many different potential proteins that could be made that are 117 amino acids long. That's a lot of zeros and a completely intractable number of proteins to ever build and test. But 7,000, that's within the wheelhouse of things that we can do. 
So it's exciting and mind blowing that this um, just came out and that they're able to make new enzyme from scratch. So who knows what's next? I'd love to hear if you have an idea of what's next. Um, thanks for hanging out with me during this uh, protein and medicines week and looking forward to our future lectures together. man a lot of stuff i keep googling while i'm listening to this stuff um, all right one step closer to eternal youth necromancy and